So, good afternoon, everyone. This is going to be the last official lecture that you will get in this course. And as a matter of fact, given the current COVID situation, it might be the last lecture you will get at this university for a while, okay? at least physically. But it's cool because it's also the coolest lecture of Design 101. Because today we talk about presentation 101, how to give presentations. Okay? So let me start with this. Who is this person? Martin Luther King, okay? The guy from I Have a Dream. And you see, it's strange that when I, it could be strange that when I start with uh, how to give presentations, I start with a picture like this, because you go like, well, this has nothing to do with presentations. Presentations are usually a computer, a projector, and then an image, and then some person talking technical stuff or but that's not true. A presentation really is passing on a message. And the presentation can change your life and it can also change the life of people. That's why giving presentations in this profession is incredibly important. Okay? It's the difference between having success or not in a business. Because you will spend the rest of your career probably trying to sell stuff to people mostly technical stuff to non-technical people. And expressing yourself clearly and in an attractive way is key to success. Okay? That's just a preamble. So let's start with this. Fucking Austria. Okay? The point though is that it's not fucking Austria. It's fucking. Austria. So there was a mistake. But in reality, it's not that. Greg. Yes, yes. It's not called fucking Austria. It's a fucking. There is a village in Austria called fucking. Okay? And you pronounce it fucking. So what do we learn from this? Three things. First of all, punctuation is important. Second, pronunciation is important. And third, it's always good to start in a striking way. I gave this star once in Austria. I can tell you the reactions were funny. Okay? But I had the attention of the people. In general, today, there will be rather explicit content, okay? Because I am very passionate about giving presentations. And I think I'm pretty good at that. So, first message is that, in general, in life, you are not a passenger, okay? Or if you want to hear it like this, you're not a fucking passenger, okay? You're driving your life. And the thing with presentations is that 99% of the presentations suck. You want to see examples of that? Let's have a look at examples. This, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And this. And in the end, this leads to something known as death by PowerPoint. I find myself very often at conferences where people are giving presentations, and half of the audience is asleep, and the other half is checking emails or checking Twitter or Facebook. Okay? Which is not the point of giving a presentation. The problem also with um, doing slides like the ones I've just shown you is that sometimes they can obscure reality and they can even kill people. You want an example? This is an example. What you see here is actually an official slide by NASA. NASA engineers were tasked 
with a mission. The problem was the following one. The space shuttle had gone into orbit to do some space shuttle thingy, right? Usually orbit around the planet, dock to ICA, to the International Space Station and do stuff. And then they noticed that during the takeoff, a little piece of foam had broken off. Okay? But they had already departed and were in orbit. And the question was, is it okay if we try to re-enter without any problem? So NASA called the engineers and said, like, can you check into this? Okay? And they did. And this is the result. Now, the problem of all this and it's hidden in the slide. It's this here. Volume of RAM is 1920 versus 3 for test. What does this mean? That in reality there had been already once an incident like that. That a piece of foam had broken off. And that piece of foam had a certain size, a certain volume. And the volume was free. Okay? But the piece of foam that had broken off, in this case, was 600 times larger. And when the engineers presented the results from their study to the people who had to take the decision whether to re-enter normally or not, they did so with this type of slide. And the people who were listening to the engineers, they were seeing this blah, 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 blah and they were like, uh, okay, did it already happen once? Yes. Did it go well? Yes. Okay, let them re-enter. And the thing exploded. Okay. And killed people. So, PowerPoint slides actually can actually really, really kill people. So, let's look at some basics first of all. Some common mistakes. One mistake is teleprompting. Because people tend to put every word they are going to say in their PowerPoint slides, although this eliminates the need to memorize your talk, ultimately this will make your slides crowded, wordy, and boring. You will lose the attention of your audience before you even reach the bottom of your slide. And you see what is happening here? First of all, I'm reading. And to read, I have, I'm turning my back on you. And as you know, turning your back on people is not polite. Second, if the room was larger, you probably wouldn't hear me that well. The other thing is that it's given that you are much faster at reading silently than I can read loudly. So what you actually did in reality was that you were reading ahead and then you ended before me while I was still reading. And then once you're done, you see this guy standing here with his back on you and you start a book. I wonder what the weather is today, and you stop paying attention, okay? Second basic mistake is spelling mistakes. Many people don't run spell checkers, and that's something that you have to do. You see when you have this little wiggly red line under word, usually it means that something is not okay, and maybe you should go and fix it. Although it's funny, you know, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. It's amazing. What the brain does, what your brain does, is error correction the whole time. That's why it's not a problem that there are typos. So if it's not a problem that there are typos because you can correct them anyway, why is it a problem if you have typos on your slides? Or, in other words, it looks like you don't care. Now, if you as a speaker don't care, why the hell should I care as an audience member? Right? So, third one is bullet pointing. In general, there's a problem with PowerPoint, and that is that, or PowerPoint style software, it's this bullet thing that, that it has that it invites you to drop one bullet after the other. And this will render slides verbose. And on top of that, you even can invent stuff. For statistics, in terms of how many bullets you can put on a slide in PowerPoint right now, it's at 32. You can put 32 bullets, and then it will stop accepting another bullet. And in terms of indentation levels, 
PowerPoint will go to, down to eight levels, which is absurd. Okay. Fifth classical mistake are uh, weird color schemes because you feel creative. Don't do that. We had a lot of discussions about colors. Sixth basic mistake is that you stick to a default template that is offered to you. You see, you open PowerPoint, you say new presentation, and then it gives you a range of predefined schemes. Why is that a mistake in your opinion? Because uh, when people recognize a template, they uh, have some sort of deja vu and it will lead to some distraction eventually. Because it feels like something I really see. Yeah. Or, it's not attractive. Or it goes back to the other point. It, you don't care, okay? There's no personality in all of this. This is the same as everyone has IKEA furniture at home. In the end, it's, it's not unique, okay? Seventh mistake is that you put things on a slide that no sane person can understand in a matter of seconds. Especially mathematicians have a tendency to do that, including my dear colleagues from computational science. Sometimes they drop slides with eight formulas on one slide. They leave the slide for three seconds, expecting you to suck in everything, and then go oh, the next one. I don't know. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm stupid, and everyone else is a genius around me. But sucking in something like this usually takes a little bit of time. Okay. Eighth and last classical mistake is that you go crazy about fonts because you have hundreds of fonts of your, on your machine now. Don't do that, okay? Because it makes it look childish and arbitrary. But we also had that, okay? Goes back to a bunch of design principles we've seen so far. Now, in the 60s, there was this scientist called Mirabi, and uh, he was a psychologist, and he did this study on how people communicate in terms of through which channels. And he established that when it's about communicating, 55% of the signal goes through body language. 38% goes through the voice and the tone of people. And only 7% goes through the spoken words. It's impressive if you think about it. There's a problem with that. It's bullshit. Okay? Mirami actually did those studies. And a lot of people have taken those studies and said, you know, when you give PowerPoint, uh, when you give presentations, you have to be sexy and uh, sassy and smart. No, 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 it's not about that. What Mirabi did was actually study how people who have a romantic encounter for the first time, how they behave. So you're sitting at the, in a tete-a-tete, -tete, okay? And well, essentially, what are you really interested in? Body language, okay? voice and tone, and probably you're not even listening, you're just looking at the other person because, well, you want to hook up, okay? My model, and also because if, if this was true, then it would mean that I should, instead of giving this 200-slide uh, presentation to you, I should just tell you, you know what, go to the gym, get a cool body, and then you will be successful at giving presentations. That doesn't work like that, okay? For me, there's more this thing here. That there's an interplay between content and form that there is a certain form in which you can give a presentation and there's a certain content that you want to transmit to the audience. Now the thing is that form without content is meaningless. So if you have super beautiful slides but they contain essentially zero information, then the whole thing means nothing. And the other counterpart is that content without form will go unnoticed. So even if you on your slides are presenting a new physical theory or something like this, and nobody gets it because it's hidden somewhere in some disgusting slides, well, then you also lose, okay? You can also rephrase this as a bad presentation will go under, and a decent presentation is decent, okay? But a good presentation can change your life. And I mean it. I will give you an example of that. In general, when it comes to presentations, I like to think like this gentleman here. I ask this question every year. Is there anyone who knows who this gentleman is? He's a musician and a comedian. His name is Henry Rollins. 
you should check some videos on YouTube. And he was the founder of a band called Black Flag, which was essentially the first real punk rock band. Okay. And then he went solo. And when he writes lyrics, he has, I would say, a bunch of pretty cool lyrics. So he's a very positive person, takes no drugs, he's always positive, but he expresses it in a very aggressive way. Okay. In general, your life is very short. I'm sorry to shock you, but a hundred years from now, you will be dust. Okay. So the question is, what do you do from now until then? Okay. Now, I know that some of you are pretty good already at giving presentations. Okay. One example is Mr. Romanelli, who has this... this uh, <laughs> You could sell fridges to Eskimos, for sure. So, I guess that you could say something like, you know, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. Who is this gentleman here? Kimi Raikön. Once he was driving at more than 300 kilometers per hour, and then the box contacted him over the speakers, and like, you know, maybe you should do this and this and this. And then he replied, life all over the world, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing. Okay? So, when it comes to giving tips on life, I am not a truth dispenser, okay? Or tips on how to give presentations. One thing which is true, though, is that when you give a presentation, you have to have a certain style, which is your style. The question is, what is your style? And maybe your style is more like this, okay? Or your style is more like that. It depends, okay? Essentially, you have to find your style. One mistake that you can do after seeing this whole lecture is that you try to mimic me. Don't do that, okay? Because this is the result of 25 years of presentations. And I still get better and better every day. I'll show you the first presentation I ever gave and the one that changed my life. It was in uh, 1999, and it was my very first conference. It was in uh, Bruges, I think, in Belgium. Well, it was in Ghent, in Belgium, and it was at the conference. The conference had lasted the whole week, and my talk was the very last talk of the very last day on a Friday afternoon. It was during summer. It was 35 degrees outside. People were already dead. My presentation was at 5 p.m., but the conference had gone over time, and instead of 5 p.m., it became 5.10, 5.20, 5.30, 5.40. So by the time I get to give the presentation, I was nervous, tired, and I had a room of 150 people in front of me who were tired and just wanted to go home. Okay? And I was a very shy master student. I had hair until here. Okay? I was also fitter than now. And I started with this presentation. This is the, these are original slides. Okay? It was a presentation on a tool I had written during my master thesis, which was a software visualization tool. So, original title slide. So, I start the presentation. There's these people in front of me. I was shy, so my voice was very low, okay? And people started looking around. Now, the thing is, it was 1999. Back then, people didn't have laptops like they have them today. We had, actually, for the whole research group, one single laptop. And every time one of us went on a conference, you had to go and get the laptop. Okay? So in Bern, I was doing a master in Bern, University of Bern. I went and got the laptop. And then I went to Belgium. The thing is that the bastard who used the laptop before me had left on a screensaver, okay? which would kick in automatically if there was inactivity. So I was giving a presentation, so I started slowly with terrible, terrible slides, okay? Like really, really <laughs> terrible, okay? Then I went into this, and here I started spending some more time on the slide, because I had to explain stuff, you know, the years of this and blah, 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 blah. And at one moment, the screensaver kicks in. Like, screen is gone, there's a screensaver, okay? And I froze. And a hundred people there were like, what is happening now? Okay? And I went into full panic mode. Now, it's funny because back then we also didn't have laser pointers like this. There was this bamboo stick which was three meters long. 
okay? And you would then basically point to the projection like this. So I had this bamboo stick, the laptop was over there, and attached to it there was a little mouse. And then, I don't know what happened, but it came to me. I looked at the computer, I looked at the screen, I looked at the people who were looking at me, and I took the bamboo stick and went like swoosh on the mouse. And it moved just a little bit, but enough to wake the computer up again, and the screen came back. And the audience went into a roar, right? Whoa, this was so cool. And after that, it was smooth sailing. And I went to the end of the presentation, okay? Now, why did this presentation change my life? Because I was a finishing master student, and I didn't know what to do with my life. And I had done something during the master thesis, which was um, research relevant. After that, it led, it led to a publication. And I was not sure whether I wanted to go on or not. And because of the positive energy that I got from these people, I decided to actually give it a shot at doing a PhD. And then I did a PhD. And after the PhD, I did the postdoc. And then I became a professor. And it's 2020. And here I am. Okay. So one presentation. If that presentation would have gone bad, you would probably enjoy a better lecture by a better professor. Look at it like this. But in general, a good presentation can change your life. And you see, when you give presentations, slides, slides, in my opinion, can be pieces of art. I spent at least an hour on this simple slide just trying to find the right picture in the right resolution in reality the original picture at the bottom facing in the other direction and now I just look to the left so I flipped the picture I put it in gray mode and then I went to look for a good font and so on I did a fading effect from right to left and so on it looks like I'm crazy about this but the result the result then is pure aesthetics for me so let's look at some practical advice when it comes to giving presentations the first one is that you should know your audience. That means that you have to understand who you are talking to. Because if you're talking to scientists, then you shouldn't give a presentation like for kids. If you're giving a presentation to kids, then you shouldn't talk like you're a scientist. You have to adapt your presentation. Okay? Very important. The other thing is, the audience is never hostile. Never. Think about that. Because always when you give a presentation, you have this thing of, it's like some antagonistic setting. I am giving a presentation in front of people, so I'm giving the presentation against the people. Because, and if it sucks, I might get attacked. But in reality, the setting is not like that. The setting really is that people who are in the audience, they want you to succeed, right? Because the worst thing that can happen to them is that you give a terrible presentation, because then you're wasting their time. So it's a friendly environment. It's scary because it's a lot of people, but it's friendly, okay? Of course, there's always the random asshole in the audience that in, in life in general, okay, wherever you go. So one thing is also that you have to respect the audience. So these people are in general friendly to you. They want to learn something from you. They want to hear something from you. So respect them, as in don't offend them, don't attack them, don't talk down to them like they're idiots. Okay. More like um, you want to get something back from them. Okay. One problem also is that, well, if you think about it, imagine you're giving a presentation, and this here essentially is a one hour and 20 minutes long presentation. There's a lot of messages, right? You are saying a lot of things. And the question is, should you spend energy to convey each and every message? I don't think so. In reality, what has to happen is that one message, one message has to emerge from all of this. So giving the presentation, in reality, is always about passing on one single message. 
It sounds astonishing, you don't know, wait a second, I have so many things to say, but it's not true. So, for the record, this whole thing here does not actually apply for lectures. Lectures is, are, are really a different beast, because there I'm trying to convey knowledge in a broader structured way. The slides will look different, they will look more technical, or there will be more content. This year, a presentation like this is more about selling one thing, one message. And usually, what do you think the message really is? What are you saying? Any guess? What do you think you're selling when you give a presentation? Yourself. Yourself. That's what you're really doing. You're selling yourself. Okay? So think about this. Whenever you give a presentation, of course there's a context, of course there's a setting, maybe there's a grade involved and so on. But in reality it's about waking up just one person in the audience and the one person might change your life. Because maybe because you give a presentation like that, that person might, might, might come to you after the presentation like, hey, that was pretty cool. And then one year later, five years later, ten years later, this person will come back like a boomerang to you, okay? And suddenly offer you a job. So when it comes to how much you should invest and what kind of outcome you should hope for, I believe that in reality, like it is also in life, you know, in life, everyone who wants to get rich never gets rich, okay? So this is not about, I need now to give the perfect presentations because it's all about, no, it's not about that. Don't, don't go with certain hopes. Just try to invest as much as necessary. If you're curious about this, when I am invited to give a keynote at the conference, which is like the, the opening talk, and usually it's free form, I can spend up to a year just working on the presentation. A year, okay? But think about it as well. Um, I've given presentations in front of, I'm not saying a, a thousand people, but six, eight hundred people, yes. It's massive, okay? This also means that I'm occupying the time of six to eight hundred people. So I rather have my act together and give a cool presentation because it's worth it, okay? Now, this also leads to the question of um, how important are slides? How much time should I spend on a slide? Now, the first thing about slides is that slides are in reality visual aids. The emphasis is not on aids, it's on visual. They help you to convey the message. The message comes out of this hole here, okay, and enters these holes here in your head. This is just a supporting act, okay? It's like the sidekick in a movie. Now, obviously, if the sidekick is cool, the movie is better, okay? And it is a limited sidekick. It's, it's a real estate, really. This is a surface that, in this case, is a four meters by two meters, so I have eight square meters of sidekick. And I better use those eight meters, okay? I've given presentations where the sidekick, the screen was 20 by eight meters, so 10 times that large. And then obviously you can do better things, cooler things, okay? But in general, slides, they just help you to convey the message. And when it comes to slide design, there's a fundamental principle. If you look at this slide, for example, it is conveying a certain amount of information, right? Now, this conveys exactly the same amount of information, but it uses much less noise. This is pure signal. So if you put the two together, the one on the left is detailed, the one on the right is effective. The message is the same. So I'm not saying here that, you know, you should always go for the one on the right. It depends on the audience. Because sometimes you have an audience that will not like this uh, fancy slide design zen thing going on here. They just want to have bullet, bullet, bullet. So knowing your audience, you know, these people are bullet-driven minds. So you go for bullets, okay? 
Though, in general, not all details matter. People are not made to absorb that much information in such a short time. So one thing, we already saw this once, is omit needless words on your slides. Okay? And I can give you a very, very impressive example of that. And that is, I guess, you might have heard of this gentleman here, wrote some really beautiful books. Okay? This gentleman also received the Nobel Prize for literature, once made a bet with a couple of um, friends who were also writers, and he said that he could write a novel in six words. And the others, they say like, nah, impossible, you're good, but not that, nobody can write a novel in six words. He won the bet, okay? And his novel was this one here. Pretty cool, huh? You see, synthesis is an exercise. It's not about being verbose. It's about being as concentrated as you can. This is writing plutonium, essentially. Okay? So deep, so many things in six words. As you know by now, after all these lectures, design is not the abundance of simplicity, Design is the absence of complexity. That's what really matters. So let's look at some simple rules of design. I call them the crap principles. Chrome task, repetition, alignment, and proximity. First one is try to have a contrast which is as high as possible in the slide. Why? Because you want to wake up people. Then, Repetition is really about be consistent throughout the slides in terms of develop a visual language, for example, a certain font choice, a certain color scheme choice, and then apply it consistently because this will denote your personality and your style. Then, if possible, you should always align things on a slide. You see, and this can go pretty far. For example, there was a conference last year when there were still conferences. It was in Montreal, and um, a guy I know who now is uh, at Microsoft gave a presentation, and one of his very first slides was this. The presentation was actually amazing, super good paper, okay? And I looked at the slide, and I said like, no, there's a problem here. What is the problem? Yeah. This space here is kind of weird compared to that one. It's this slight misalignment, this last detail that he didn't go into. And it's a pity. I'm obviously, I'm, I'm a fetishist here, right? In that room with 200 people, I was probably the only one noticing. And actually then, I had to give a tutorial on how to give presentations. So after his presentation, I asked him, can I have your slides? And he was like, oh, because you liked them. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Super nice slides. And then I took this slide, <laughs> put it in the tutorial, and then everybody at the conference knew that I, I had just dissed him through that slide. The last principle is proximity. We already spoke about this, which is essentially the usage of white space. Okay? And this is, that's something that that, Take is an art, in my opinion. It's not about filling the slides with stuff with impressive pictures, okay? It is really about considering this as a real estate and occupying it in a meaningful way, okay? This is like when you have to put furniture into a big living room, you just don't stuff everything inside, but you just try to place things in a good order. Another thing is that when you give a presentation, Emphasizing everything is emphasizing nothing. This goes back to the highlighting principle we've seen. And last but not least, when you give presentations, presentation slides are not documents, or like some people call them, slide units. Now, again, this only applies to presentations, not for lectures. Because for lectures, what really happens, and it's a sad fact nowadays, is that professors have this um, slide unit type of slide, okay? I don't want to make names, you know, all these guys, okay? And then they just have bullet, 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 bullet. 
And then what happens? Is that you basically get the slides and then you study with the slides, right? This is your study material. You don't go and read books. You just look at the slides hoping that there's enough information. This is a different kind of thing. So this does not apply to lectures. So problem again is really this thing that PowerPoint invites you to add a title and add a text. But in reality, there's no need to have a title on every slide. And there's no need to have text on every slide. Okay? And that's what happens then. You start typing. Now, if you um, would ask the question, well, how many bullets should I have on a slide? Personal opinion, no bullets. But in reality, it's not about bullets. It's about points. Every slide should have a point, as in a reason to exist. Because while I'm projecting the slide, it's 100% occupation of a certain part of your field of view. That's what you see. Right? So if I have several points on the slide, your brain will not be able to digest that. So every slide drops, and then you look at it, and then the next slide drops. That's the way it has to work. Going a little bit into Occam's razor, if you look at the slide like this, what do you think the point is of this slide? Well, somebody did it, so, and that wasn't me. To show the over the bike sales Yeah, that's a possibility, right? To show that over the years the bike sales have gone up, okay? But is this really a point? And then why are there cyclists in the background? And why are you using 3D to obscure this thing? Why do you have to say 2002 to 2007 if it already says it here? Why do you have to show all these numbers? Okay? You can take this slide and make it like this. And then have the message. And the message here in this case is that in 2007, we sold more than 5,000 bikes. Because the exact number also, which is 5,035, is not important. This, of course, depends on the audience, right? Now, slides in general, apart from being visual aids, apart from being a real estate, in reality, they're also a crutch, in my opinion. They slow you down. Understand that, because every time I click, slide will appear. I need to wait until you suck in the contents. And it is pacing my discourse artificially. I have to address what is written on the slide. That's why lectures function differently. In a lecture, I can barely improvise, because I need to look at what is there and then convey, convey, convey. So slides in general, if you are not really good at walking, then a crutch can help you. But if you're good at walking, then the slides will actually slow, slow you down. The best presentation I've seen in my life had zero slides. It was just a guy talking. But he was a rhetorics professor, and uh, yeah, that's different level. Okay? Now, if you have one point per slide, this means that you will have a lot of points. right? And I told you that the point of a presentation, a global presentation, is to convey a message, to tell a story. So the question is, where on those slides is the story? So there must be somewhere a slide which is the slide, which conveys the message, tells the story. And that's not true. In reality, the story is in between. I'm, telling, I'm using the slides as a visual support, and I'm telling a story that has nothing to do with the slides. The slides are, it's just a sidekick. Okay? Another problem is that if you have text-heavy slides, another problem kicks in, which is multitasking. Now, just about this. Multitasking, for your information, when it comes to paying attention, is actually a myth. Okay? Because we are biologically incapable of processing attention-rich inputs simultaneously. We can't. Okay? Even if you think you know people who can do three things at the same time, we are not really good at that. Okay? There's one thing you can do. 
So the whole point is to create a story. So you have to tell a story. Okay? Now, what is a good type of story? And here, classicism can help us. The Greeks invented all of that. Okay? A good story is structured like a Greek tragedy. There's always the beginning, which is an exposition. Then there's a conflict and the climax. And then there's a resolution. The beginning, complicated stuff, end. Think about a good movie. That's the way it is. Think about the fairy tale. Fairy tales are good stories structurally. They always start slow, start increasing the, the speed, the intensity. Then there's a climax, and then everybody lives happily ever after. Okay. So when it's about composing stories that you want to tell, good stories are simple, they're concrete, and they're emotional. You saw what I just did? I did this. Blah, 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 story, the Greek tragedy, and so on. And like, good stories are simple, concrete, and emotional. That's another type of giving presentation. I call this the grimy style. Does anyone know what grim grimy style is? There's a rapper called Busta Rhymes. Do you know Busta Rhymes? He invented grimy style. It's a very aggressive, very fast type of rapping. Okay? And I have given presentation where each slide will be there for less than a second. And then and then you can do 500 slides in 10 minutes. It's very intense, very interesting. Now let's quickly look at fonts. Because fonts, after all, you're using some kind of types on the slides. The ultimate guide for me is this book here called Just My Type. Fantastic, amazing book. I am a, I'm a font fetishist, okay? So, in reality, you should choose the font that suits you, that represents you. And you know, this can go very far. I mean, one thing, one extreme is Comic Sans, okay? The other one is Times New Roman, and in between there's everything. But I can tell you one thing, don't leave it up to randomness. Pick a font, your font. You don't know how many hours and days I spend looking at new fonts, okay? Just to try to find the perfect font. So I'll give you a bunch of hints on what is a good font. One I like a lot, a lot is Helvetica Noia. Wonderful. Very, very simple. Stylish. For the record, I already said this once, the Swiss are incredible font creators. Especially in the 60s and 70s, they created some of the most beautiful fonts. One which works very well, that you also know pretty well, is called uh, Calibri. That was commissioned by Microsoft because Microsoft used to have Times New Roman for PowerPoint, and that's why my presentation from 1999 was in Times New Roman, okay? And now they are using Calibri, which is the standard font if you open Excel or Word, that's the one that you have there. Very, very nice font. The problem is that it's the standard font now. So within a couple of years, people will start getting bored of it. Then one which I like a lot is also Gilson's Light. Very slick, very subtle. There's the heavier version called Gilson's, which was the standard Apple font for a number of years. Steve Jobs always gave presentations of Gilson's. The problem with Gilson's is that it was a standard font. So after a couple of years, it was like the, the boring Apple font. Gilson's light gives a lighter twist of it. If you want to have heavier stuff, Impact is a very nice one. If you have, want to have a monospaced one, my favorite one right now is called Menlo. It's not true, actually, because I do have two new favorite fonts, a monospaced one and a, and a other type, but I will not reveal them, okay, because they're mine. One which I also like a lot, I used to like a lot, was Optima. I gave lectures for probably like half a decade using Optima as a font. It's a modern font, by the way. As in, uh, there's different types of families. This one is, um, belongs to the modern type, which means the slants are vertical. The slant is, if you take a letter like the O, which you take the two thinnest parts and you draw a line through it. And if the line is vertical, then it's a modern font. Otherwise, if you take an, an older font like a Bookman or Bragadocio, then you will see that uh, the slant is skewed a little bit. Okay. Then, surprisingly, one I like a lot is Times New Roman, but in italics. It's beautiful. Times New Roman, there's no way to 
not say that this is slick. Okay? And then the most beautiful font at an objective level ever created was this one, is this one here. It's Frutiger. This used to be the standard font of Uzi, actually. When Uzi was created, they bought this font. This font is commercial, so you cannot download it for free. But this is just amazingly beautiful as a font. Okay? In the meantime, with the new redesign of Uzi's uh, look and feel, they went for another font called Accidents Grotesque, which has an absurdly sounding name. It's also a very nice font. It's just suspiciously similar to Arial. And Arial is the IKEA of fonts. Okay? The Kallax and the Billy, that's what you have. Okay? Arial is that. One I used to, if you would have taken a lecture with me three years ago, you would have seen probably this one here, Tirasons, which is very nice. It's a completely open source and it's maintained by an open source community. After this, I gave a little trip into this thing here called Proxima Nova Condensed. Also very, very nice. Okay. Questions about fonts? I hope you understand that each font conveys a totally different style. Okay. Some fonts are more feminine, some are more masculine, some are more primitive. There's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole character in a font, okay? personality. So that's why choosing a font is actually important. Now, as I already said, every presentation is one goal. And I also said every slide is one goal. So keep that in mind. So now, since slides are so important, what about pictures? Because, uh, well, it's a lot of real estate here. Let's put pictures on it. First of all, empty patterns. Do not use other clip art. Do not use small images. Do not use watermark images. The watermark is this thing here. Okay, it, it means you're a cheap bastard. Don't distort images. Okay, when you put images, go full quality, as high resolution as you can. So when I usually give my my professional presentations. Each image actually has absurd resolutions, like 4,000 by 3,000 pixels. And then you can point out, wait a second, the slide is only 1,920 by 1,080. I don't care. Okay? It has to be like that. Then, sometimes it's also good to use a neutral background to make the thing stand out. Okay? Now, why is it important to have good pictures? And you remember the picture superiority effect, which said, a picture has to support the message. If it doesn't do that, then it will actually diminish the value of what you're trying to convey. So at the same conference where I was last year, another guy I knew, I know, gave a presentation, he actually presented one of our papers, okay? And well, Simone Scalabino is a very nice guy, super good at making presentations, and then he, sh he showed this slide here, okay? Where it's about um, two things that you want to show, I will now go into fixing solutions and then we'll look at API sequences. And you see the cauliflower, right? And after the presentation, I went to him and was like, dude, what the hell was the cauliflower? Like, why do you have a cauliflower on a slide? Because all people talked about of this presentation, like, oh, the cauliflower was very nice. It was a technical presentation about computer science stuff, okay? So that's what I mean with non-supporting pictures, okay? So where do you get good pictures from? Well, if you want to spend money, this is the mother of all sites. It's called iStock Photo. You find, uh, you give them keywords and you find super professional pictures, but you have to pay for that, okay? Then you get, can go through Google. The problem is that Google in the meantime has changed their policy, so it's not anymore very simple to download the pictures and not in good quality. Usually it's a pain in the butt. One site I use a lot is this one here. It's called sxc.hu, so it's a Hungarian website. It's like iStock Photo, but it's for free. Now, whether it's legal or not, I don't know, but as far as I know, it's for free, super high resolution, super nice interface, okay? Now, so you give a presentation. Presentation lasts a certain amount of time. How do you structure the presentation? So you remember the scaling fallacy? There is also a presentation scaling fallacy as well. Because the thing is that if you have a presentation to give, 
and the presentation lasts five minutes. Then you have slide, 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 slide. In the end, that's what it is, right? You have to present one slide after the other. That's the way slide software works. Now, you might say, well, okay, but your presentation now is 20 minutes. So what do you do? Well, okay, you will just slide, 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 like this, okay? And then you chain them like a train, like this. That doesn't work, okay? Because what you really have is some kind of valley here below, okay? And here you have like a, a valley here. So if you do a bridge like this, that kind of holds. But if you do a bridge this long, this will never hold. And what does not hold? The attention of the people. What will fall apart is that your audience, because you're talking like a train, eventually will fall off. Okay, we will come to this, but just know that roughly the attention span of people is 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, they will start uh, wandering with their minds. Okay, probably some of you right now are wandering with their minds. Okay. So what do you do? Well, you put pillars there, like this. And this can help you to support the suspension bridge. Okay. So pillars can be like crucial slides. So imagine you have, for example, a white look and feel. So all the slides have a white background or a light background. The pillar slides, you should, for example, change their color scheme so that when a pillar slide comes, it's like an orientation point. And it also allows you to basically take a break and say like, okay, Let's stop here and let's go in this direction. Okay? Do you want to do a break? Because I can just uh, push on and then we'll be done. Break or not? Democracy, people. Should I push on? Let's push on. So, I call this also scaffolding. You see when they construct the building, they put some scaffolding around the building, then they can paint the building, and then they take the scaffolding down again. So sometimes these pillar slides here, they are actually not strictly necessary for the presentation, but during the construction of the presentation, you might use them. Sometimes I have scaffolding slides which are just black, and there's nothing on them. I just know that this is a piece, this is a piece, this is a piece, and that's where it starts. And then I can basically take them out of the presentation again. Another thing, to reduce everything to the max, which is the principle of Occam's razor, I call this a reduction run. So what I do is I look, for example, at the presentation like this, in a light table. And then I swipe the eyes over the presentation, and I see whether there is something that is not okay. And if there's something that is somehow not okay, then my brain will tell me, yeah, maybe that one is kind of weak, okay? Now, when it comes to in intrinsic slide design, you might want to go into something like a super nice grid designs, because it's a, it's a real estate, so this is like a poster or like a document, and you might really want to have a nice grid system. Not sure about this. Probably the best grid is this one here, one shot one thing. But you can also go into something like this. You have two things to say, like for example, um, there are two types of students, uh, PhD and master student. Okay? Then you can use this. Right? Blah and blah. Okay? You have three things, blah, blah, blah. Four things, looks like that. After that, it starts to fall apart. In reality, there's also some weird relationship between software design and presentation design, if you think about it. Because a presentation is like a system, a part is like a package, a slide is like a class, a sentence is like a method, and the slide master is like a meta class. Think about this. And that's why, for example, I say a slide should convey one message. When it's about object-oriented design, you should know that a class should do one thing and one thing only. Okay? Now, 
Let me quickly open a parenthesis, which is, what about slide software? There's Keynote, there's PowerPoint, there's Prezi, there's Beamer. My general take is, Keynote and PowerPoint are technically equivalent. I hate to say that, because 10 years ago PowerPoint was way behind, but Microsoft has caught up, okay? And they're essentially there now. Plus, PowerPoint is a super nice feature to look at the layers, which, is, which I would like to have in Keynote. My personal favorite is still Keynote. Beamer is, you know what Beamer is? It's a LaTeX package that allows you to create slides with LaTeX. You know Professor Cardanina? <laughs> Beamer, okay? Professor Furia? Beamer, okay? It's slick in a way, and I'm sure that 100 years ago it was super cool, okay? Then there is Prezi. Prezi is like the, the, the software for millennials, I guess. It has this thing that everything is on the web, and then when you have transition, it, it rotates and moves and stuff. You know Pau Tasso? He does that, okay? I've seen people get seasick while looking at Prezi presentations. So, your call. Then what about 4 to 3 or 16 to 9? As you might have noticed, this is a 16 to 9 ratio. And that's a, that's a non-trivial issue, actually, because I had for like 18 years, I was using 4 to 3, because back then there was only 4 to 3, then 16 to 9 came up, but already 10 years ago, it took me like 10 years to switch. Because I was trying to find the perfect ratio, which is difficult in 16 to 9. In the meantime, I figured it out. Because you see, in, when it's 4 to 3, power, um, Keynote and also PowerPoint tells you that the slide is 1024 pixels by 768. And I always had this uh, strange obsession with um, numbers of powers of two, okay? So I, in my mind, I would know, okay, 64 pixels, 32, 16, 90, 128, and then I would place things pixel perfect. And then 16 to 9 came up, but this broke everything, okay? In the meantime, I figured out that the base unit is 60 pixels in that. So I create, in my mind, these cells of 60 pixels, and then I can place things around, okay? At the beginning, I started off with 120, and then it looked like that. But it took me, literally, months and months, while I, these are the concrete examples from my machine, where I was obsessing, like, how do I do that, okay? And then do this, and then do that, and then do this, and then, oh, no, this is not okay, because this is not a fraction of 60, and, uh, and then what about this, and what if I want to have a two-sided thing, and so on. And the result, in the end, went towards something like this. So this is more for slide you meant stuff, okay? And then I started obsessing about fonts, because changing the ratio is kind of easy, which was difficult for me, but you see, you cannot use the same fonts, because the slide now is much wider, the lines are much wider. So, for example, in this case here, you remember how many words or syllables you have to put on a slide, or on a line? This is too wide, okay? So I started obsessing about fonts, okay? I tried different fonts. You remember when I said a feminine font? This, for example, is for me, is, is kind of feminine, okay? Which is not a bad thing for the record. So then, blah, and I went on, and in the end, I kind of came up with something which, in my mind, looked decent. Although, as you might have noticed, I'm not really the slide unit person. But if I was to give a slide unit lecture, then probably I would start using something like this. I will not go into color schemes, okay, because I've obsessed over color schemes in the last six months. You know, a lockdown can give you a lot of time. Now, what about videos and what about comic strips? Should you build videos and comic strips into a presentation? In general, videos are dangerous because they attract the complete attention and they take the attention away from you. So I did give a keynote once where I showed five movies, five pieces of five different movies, the good movies, and then it was an explicit stepping out of the sea. Okay? So you saw me like step out, and then the movie would play, usually like a minute or two, okay? And then I would step back in and continue the discourse. That kind of works. Comic strips, comic strips don't work, okay? 
They simply don't. The problem is that comic strips need, need higher level functions to be interpreted right. So right now, as I'm talking, you're kind of reading and you think, why is this guy still talking? He's disturbing me. I want to understand the point of the comic strip. Okay? So comic strips don't work. Don't work. Okay? Then what about going full frontal or going about Q&A? With this, I mean, in general, asking questions to an audience especially if the audience is large, is very dangerous because you might get back bad answers. Okay? Like the, you know, the idiot from before is always in the audience. There's always a wannabe funny guy in the audience. Always. So imagine you ask a question which is kind of open-ended. Okay? You risk getting a funny answer back and that will, can destroy your presentation. So when you ask questions, Usually it's better if you, for example, go through hand raising. Like that. How many people know Java? And then people raise their hand. Okay? And you hope that nobody knows that. Then what about text versus pictures? You see, text, a presentation like this, can, you remember the crotch thing? You know, I always have this mystery that uh, I go to conferences and a bunch of people give presentations like I've done so far, but a bunch of other people, especially people, for example, from Asia, they do more this sliding and thing, although it's a presentation and it's not a lecture. And I have started to understand why they do that. Because for a beginner, this is the best thing you can have. It's, just, it's really supporting you. Okay? So for the record, this was a presentation that my oldest son had to give at, uh, in fifth class. And uh, it was about Second World War, and he was rehearsing it at home. I can tell you, I don't want to be my kid when it's about rehearsing a presentation. That was pretty terrible as an experience. Parenthesis closed. Let's go to delivery, and then we're done for today. First of all, when you give a presentation, you have to rehearse. That's very important. You cannot just pretend that, oh, I will go there and then smash the audience. That doesn't work like that. Unless you're a rock star, that simply doesn't work. So even I, although I never do rehearsals with people, I rehearse with myself, but not me talking in front of the mirror. I mean, yeah, beginners do that. I usually rehearse in my mind. Like I look, I sit in front of the computer and go click, click, click. And then if my brain can somehow interpret it, then it means it's okay. Also, the light table view will save your soul anyway. So one other thing I do is a speed run as well. So I take the presentation, I, I press play, and then I click as fast as I can, and I look at the slides, like this flashy thing. And if at one moment I break with that, wait, what is this? Then it means that I have to change something. But in general, understand that everything here, right now, everything is improvised. Every word is improvised. It's not that I have a test standard text. That's why this kind of presentation needs to be rehearsed. And you can imagine, I've given this stuff for dozens of times, okay? People pay, actually, for this stuff. So, another very important point is that when you give presentations, I think you should show your passion. The worst thing you can have is somebody who's like, who looks bored, like, eh, eh. screw that, okay? One life, one life. Another important thing is you should always introduce yourself. Sometimes people just um, play and then uh, blah, 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 and you're like, wait a second, hello? I mean, first of all, it's politeness, but it's not only that. You know, there was, I still remember this guy, he was a postdoc from the University of Victoria in Canada, and whenever he would give a presentation, he would always start the same way. He would type a slide then you would get, be given a signal like you can start and you would say, hello, my name is Irvin, Irvin Kwan. Silence. And then he would start. And then at the end of the presentation, he would say, thank you, my name is Irvin, Irvin Kwan. It's kind of weird, right? Now, I don't remember anything about the guy anymore. I just remember that thing and I still remember the name, okay? Very important. Then, as already pointed out in a concrete way, start strong, be confident, nothing to be afraid of, keep it short, because 
audience attention will drop after 10 minutes. So one thing is that you do something which is emotionally relevant every 10 minutes. And also end on a high note. Don't just let it trail off like, oh, thank you. And then that's it. That really mark, you have to go out of a bang. One other thing is uh, if there is a podium, step away from it. Walk around, occupy the room. Then also use a remote. This thing costs 10 bucks, okay? And it might give you a job which is then 200,000 bucks a year, so I think it's worth as an investment. Also important, you should make pauses. Okay, it's not that you have to talk all the time. One other thing is never ever apologize. I hear that so often, like, oh, I'm sorry because, uh, and what are you sorry about, okay? Also, use the presenter display. You know what the presenter display is. Does anyone not know? Essentially, here I see two slides, a bunch of other information, while you just see one slide. So I can look ahead. Also, remember the B key. What does the B key do? Yeah. It goes black. It's cool, huh? Why is that important? Well, imagine you're, you have to stop for a second and draw all the attention sucking into you. If there is some projection here, the sidekick might steal your show. So you blow the sidekick away like this and like, listen to me. And then you have to listen to me, okay? Because nothing is interesting on the whiteboard and this thing is black. By the way, there's also the W key which makes it white. Then also very important, make good eye contact. You see, there's nothing back there, so don't look into eternity. Your shoes are not that interesting, don't look on the floor, okay? Don't look at the wall, don't look at the machine, look at people, okay? Now, when I say look at people, first of all is don't stare at people like, because that's creepy, okay? And people might even say that you're harassing them. So what I usually do is I jump, in case you noticed, I jump around you, right? I try to fix on someone, oh, you're awake, okay? Are you awake? Yeah, and then oh, not so much awake. And then I, hey, <laughs> okay? Also, keep the lights on in case you have uh, some conditions in the room, like it's too dark. Try to make the room as light as possible because people will fall asleep otherwise. Be prepared, which means you have to give a presentation and you know you're the first one. Check the beamer, the setup and the room beforehand. If you know you have to go there, then check everything before like this. You know it works. Then when it comes to clothing, but this is more for important events, you should be slightly more elegant than the audience. You don't have to show up like it's a wedding, okay? But you don't have to show up in your street clothes as well. It has to be important enough. You know, for example, I remember when I met first Rocco Liveto became a good friend of mine. And he was uh, the advisor of Professor Balotto. It was 2005 in Manchester, we were at this conference, and I was supposed to chair the session. Like uh, three papers are being presented by someone, and I'm moderating, let's say. So I was waiting for these people to show up, and I saw Rocco Liveto. So I was waiting, and then I see this guy enter, and yet suit, tie, looked like dressed for, for a wedding. And I was like, Italian? He was like, yeah, first conference. Like, How do you know? <laughs> like, yeah, wild guess. Last part, you should always have fun giving presentation. It's the coolest thing you can do. Okay, this is it. If you have questions, ask them now. Otherwise, the homework will be that the week after next week, in case we are not in a lockdown, on Tuesday and Thursday, each one of you will give a 300-second presentation, so a five-minute presentation, about a topic of your choice. 